great morning it has been already seeing the gospel lived out seeing these decisions to follow Jesus to trust Jesus with all their life and to lean in on the father's love today we want to continue on in Luke chapter 15 if you have your Bibles you can open them up to Luke chapter 15 it's called the gospel in the gospel the clearest ring of the gospel bell is found here because this is the story of the good father and there is none like him Swiss theologian Karl Barth who wrote thousands of words about God, came to this simple definition of who God is. God is the one who loves. That's, that is God's essence. The one who loves. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, but that's it. That God is the one who loves you doesn't matter where you are from or what you have done, that God loves you unconditionally and that you were actually made for receiving his unconditional love. But although we've been made for unconditional love, we soon learn that our acceptance is based on our performance. Uh, already in kindergarten, kids start getting separated into different groups, basics and, and regulars. And I, I, I'm assuming that there's honors uh, kindergarten as well. And throughout your scholastic career, you're, you're given grades and rank to tell you where you fit in. It's according to your performance. And this is to get you ready for the real world in which your salary and your benefits, acceptance and, and scorn is based on your performance. Performance-based acceptance. And this isn't something that's new to us, new to this century. This has been around as long as there's been people. Uh, there, there's been uh, religious systems that build this up. Hinduism has uh, karma in which you work in this life and then you are paid in the next. What you do in this life to, um, will, will shape what you receive in the next. Islam is based on these five pillars and Allah's acceptance of you is based on your keeping of these five practices. Even a uh, Performance-based acceptance comes into the sanctuary. Uh, a preacher, Fred uh, Craddock, he told the story of Luke 15 one morning, except he changed the ending. He, he said that the father gave the ring and the robe around the older son and that he killed a, a fattened calf in order to celebrate his older son's years of faithful service. And a woman in the back of the sanctuary yelled out, that's the way it should have been written. <laughs> Indeed, that's the way it would have been written if it was written by us. We're, we're, we're shaped by performance-based acceptance. It's in our religious systems. It's in our family systems. Uh, as uh, uh, oldest children usually go through this, uh, they're, they're replaced by the second born. How many of you are, are first borns out there? Raise your hand. I, I love you guys. You guys answer, you, you follow your commands. If I would have asked for the youngest to raise their hand, they would have just ignored me. They're still thinking about how they can yell something out in the sanctuary and get away with it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, See, but firstborns, they're different. Uh, firstborns come in and uh, they receive all the atten attention, all the acceptance, and they, they live in that until a second child is born. And then this younger and cuter version starts to get all the attention and it leaves the older one with, with feelings of, uh, how do I step into the limelight? Who am I? Uh, and so firstborns sometimes, oftentimes, go through self-esteem questions. And they realize that they can gain attention, gain acceptance through athletic achievement, uh, through report cards, through their piano recital. 
And so firstborns uh, have that, that drive to be accepted for what they do. And they feel that they're loved only as their performance measures up. Well, the second half of this story, the father, the good father, goes out to his firstborn, to his eldest son, and reminds him of his unconditional love. Because both sons were far away from him. Both sons were lost. And the father wants all his children to know his heart for them. So we'll open up our scripture and we'll start at verse 25. Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older, older son was in the field, of course, doing his work. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now this older brother was a typical firstborn, serious, responsible, goal-oriented, uh, following the rules. It's time to go milk the cows. Yes, Dad, I'm right there. It's time to go sow the wheat. Yes, Dad, I'll grab the seeds. Always the voice in his head was, do your duty. This is what your dad expects of you. This is what your family expects of you. And with good performance will come acceptance. And so driven by this voice, he becomes a, a model citizen a desired neighbor, a sought-after employee, and a lost son. Now, he may not have wandered away geographically, but his heart is just as far away from his father's as his younger brother. Now his story picks up after a long, hard day in the field. He comes back dirty and sweaty, and as he comes near the house, surprise, surprise, he hears a celebration. He hears music and dancing. And we realize two things immediately. Number one, that this is a loud celebration. This is not a private affair. This is meant to be a public party that everyone is invited and the, and the amps are cranked up. And number two, that this family is not Mennonite. There's a <laughs> loud music and dancing. Dancing? Are you kidding me? Oh, Bernay. <laughs> but the Near Eastern Society, a party is a loud affair with eating and music and dancing. And the elder brother, well, he's suspicious when he hears this merriment. He, he hears other people having fun and he becomes suspicious. We, so he asks uh, one of the co-workers, what is going on? And the co-worker uh, responds, are, are you you're still getting me? Uh, and the co-worker goes and he answers, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And this news infuriates him. He is angry. How dare he? How dare they? This is not fair. My brother's back safe and sound. I never left. I've been here each day, every day, working. And my father hasn't even thrown me a party. 
And so the son refuses to go in. Note that, that he refuses to go in. See, this is more than just a matter of ignoring an Evite or, or being a no-show. This is much more serious than that. Uh, scholar Kenneth Bailey, who studied Near Eastern culture, he points out that the son would have had a, a, an official role at this banquet. It would have been the son's job. His job was to welcome people as they come in. His job would be to make sure that everyone had enough food. His job was to be the father's representative. Bailey even points out a custom in which the, the older son stands outside welcoming guests barefoot. Now barefoot, to be barefoot, was to be a slave. And this older son standing outside barefoot was the father's way of saying, my best I give to you to be your servant. But this son refuses to go in. And that was a great insult. It shamed his dad. You remember back in the story of Esther. Uh, in Esther, there's uh, King Xerxes throws this party. And, and he tells uh, Queen Vashti to come. And Queen Vashti refuses. And King Xerxes burns with anger. He's furious. See, Queen Vashti refusing to come is a great public insult. It shames the king. And soon the queen is disposed of. For the, fa the, the older son to be invited to this party and not to show up is a great public insult to the father. It shames him. And we would have expected the father to punish him publicly. We would have expected the father to save face and ignore his son and just carry on with the party. But this father is like no other. And so for the second time, on the one day, he leaves his house in public humiliation in order to win back his son. The father goes out and he pleads with his son. But this time his presence and his words are met with cold resentment. We see just how far this son is away from his father by the words in his speech. If you look down, verse 27, look. He begins uh, with this word, look, no title, no respect. Even the younger son, when he addresses his dad, to say, he says, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. But this older son doesn't, uh, doesn't begin with those, uh, those kind words, politeness, respect. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. This speech illuminates his image of the father. He thinks of his father as a slave driver. All these years I've been slaving for you. That's his relationship to his dad. He is just a worker. He thinks of his dad as a, as a scorekeeper. I've never disobeyed your orders. What matters is that I've kept every one of your commands. And he thinks of his dad as stingy. But you've never even given me a young goat. And that's how a religious person sees God. As a slave driver, a scorekeeper, someone who is stingy. Look, God, I've served on committees and boards. I've given 10% of my income. I come every Sunday, even in summer. And I haven't... I haven't cheated on my spouse. I haven't murdered anyone. And things aren't working out the way I had planned. I'm alone. I'm suffering. I'm unhappy. I'm unfulfilled. See, the religious, or religion and faith are different. Religion says, if I serve God, then God will accept me. And give me what I want. 
But faith says, God has accepted me. Therefore, I can serve him. See, religion says, if I do the right things, if I say the right things, if I believe the right things, then God will accept me. God will do what I want. That's not the way the father is. See, the older brother doesn't know his, his father's heart. He doesn't know this unconditional love for him. And he certainly doesn't understand his father's unconditional love for his younger brother. He doesn't even call him his younger brother. He calls him the son of yours. Look down at verse 30. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with the prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Though millennia have passed since the first family feud, still Cain's sins are broadcast daily. The, the older brother is envious of his younger brother's relationship with his dad. And so instead of working on his own relationship with his father, he tries to destroy his brother's relationship with his father or destroy his younger brother. I think that's what's going on here when he puts in the part about the prostitutes. That's never mentioned. And some have said, well, the brother has a wild imagination. Others have said, well, that's what the brother would have done if he was on the run. But I think it's something much more insidious than that. I think that the older brother is trying to paint his younger brother as the rebellious son from Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 1, which has rules for the firstborn and for the rebellious son, verse 18 says that if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. That's what a good father is supposed to do. That's what this, this older brother is saying. Look, Dad. Everyone is here. The elders, the village is here. Look, this son of yours. What are you going to do, Dad? What is he going to do? He's been insulted publicly. He's had his character slandered. And now he's being accused of disobeying Scripture. We would expect the father to be furious. To give his son a lesson that he won't soon forget. Or we would expect the father to command his son to fulfill his duty to the family. And I'm sure that son would have obeyed him with all the bitterness in his heart still present. But the father doesn't want a servant. He wants, he longs for a son. So the father gives one of the most compassionate speeches in the New Testament, to his son, to us, who think that God is a slave driver or a scorekeeper or stingy, to us who think it's all about serving God and have forgotten his heart for us. He starts off with this tender word of affection, my son. Now, it's an accurate translation that the NIV gives I don't think it's quite right. Throughout this passage, the word son has translated another word, huios. And in, this, uh, in here, the father uses a different term. He uses technon, which I think is better as my boy. I think it's better, uh, I think the understanding of the father using the word that he would have called his son when he was just a wee little lad, when he was a chlena. And he was a running around. That word of affection that we call our children when they're, when they're small. It would have been that, that word that the father cheered as his son first got up on water skis. Or that his mother shouted out as he walked across the graduation. Uh, walked across the stage for graduation. He says, my boy, I'm always with you. 
You are with me always. And he opens up his wallet and he sees pictures, crinkled, worn, pictures of his son, his baby picture. That picture with the goofy smile after his front teeth fell out. His bar mitzvah. His, uh, the first time he drove an ox cart. My son, I am with you always. And the son who has always thought his acceptance was based on his performance now encounters his dad's unconditional love. And along with that, he gives him unconditional security. All that is mine is yours. You don't have to worry that you're going to get any less because your brother is back home. There is enough. There is enough. But he doesn't stop there. Grace doesn't stop there. The father wants his son to know his heart for him, but he wants his, he wants his son to know his heart for all his children. So he says, but we had to celebrate. Because this brother of yours, he's part of the family, this brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost, but is now found. Do you get it? Do you get it? This, this parable that started off with the Pharisees and the scribes on the outside in verse 1, complaining about the sinners being welcomed in, ends with the father making his plea to the older son, to those that have served him on the outside, who have said, this is not fair, we deserve better treatment than this, calling them to come in and to join the party. But how? Well, the same one who tells this story is the one who will provide the rescue. See, Jesus is the older brother, the firstborn, the representative of the Father, come to show us who the Father is, what his heart is like. And at that cross, Jesus stands barefoot, Outside, like the Father saying, my best is given for you. Jesus dies in our place on the outside so that you and I might be welcomed in, might join the party, and might even dance a little bit. See, so it doesn't matter if you're here for the first time or you've been here forever, it doesn't matter if you're a rebellious daughter or a religious son. It doesn't matter if you're lost in addictions, in desperation, in wandering, or you're lost in religious activity. The Father's heart goes out to you. And he's calling you, come home. Come in. Come. Come. The party is for you. I want to call the worship team up here. But before they begin to, pr uh, begin to play, I want to guide us in a prayer here. So I invite you uh, to pray uh, with me. Uh, you can uh, think, pray, say these words uh, in your heart toward the Father to remember his love for you. So if you'll bow your heads. Father, Father, I am lost. I am confused. I've tried to make my own way. I need you. I want to come home to you, to know you, to know your acceptance, to know your love. Thank you for Jesus who took my place, who died in my place, that I might live with you. And Lord, I look forward to this life with you now and always. 
Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer, welcome. Welcome home. The Father's arms are open for you. He wants you to know his unconditional love. And if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family. You belong here. And I have some gifts for you at the back at the Welcome Center to help you as you start on this journey. The Father's heart is open. Let us enter in.